Thank you very much, Paula. It's lovely to see everybody. Thank you for coming. And um, not only are you missing the sun, I might actually ask for the curtains to be closed a wee bit if you're struggling to see the screen as well, just to really rub it in <laughs> that you've chosen to be here instead of outside. Um, so as Paula has said, we're going to be focusing particularly on political priorities, attitudes and identities since the agreement, basically looking at the 25 years of data that we have with the Life and Time survey. And we'll be drawing on NILT predominantly, but with a few references to the Young Life and Times as well, which is obviously 16-year-olds and a fantastic resource. Um, uh, as you will well recall, we had big celebrations and commemorations of the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement here in Queens, and also, of course, President Biden visiting Ulster University, also time to, to uh, coincide with that anniversary. Um, and a number of the themes that we saw coming up in the panels um, that were convened for that particular event relate to some of the data that we are going to be sharing today. So what were people's priorities back in 1998 when they were casting their vote in the referendum and also casting uh, their vote for the assembly elections on the, um, in June 1998? Uh, what did they want to see from that assembly? What does that look like now, given where we are? Also thinking about identities, obviously, we know that identities was at the heart of the questions of how to manage and resolve conflict in Northern Ireland. What patterns of change have we seen over the past 25 years that relate to identities, particularly national and political identities? We're also going to be looking at attitudes, most specifically relations between communities in Northern Ireland, and then also expectations. Um, so particularly thinking about the constitutional future of Northern Ireland and where expectations have been changing, particularly post-Brexit. And yes, I have to mention Brexit, obviously. <laughs> I got it in, <laughs> in slide two. So, um, yeah, expectations, how do they sit nowadays? Um, and looking ahead to the future, bring all these things together, what sort of a society are we living in today? What does it look like? What does NILT and Young Life and Times tell us about society today, 25 years after the agreement? So I'm going to hand over to Ben for the next couple of sections. There we go, distinguished before. So what is it up to? Um, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, just to start with looking at priorities, um, it's worth bearing in mind now, we're going to go back to 1998, so when the fieldwork was done for the first Northern Ireland Life and Time survey, it's before the Assembly started sitting in earnest, which was the 2nd of December of 1999, if I remember properly. And so when we're asking about the aspirations and hopes, of what people want from the new assembly. Right now they're we're asking something, not entirely hypothetical, but the assembly wasn't fully running, so we were able to get what people would like as it gets up and running. And so in 1998, Northern Ireland and Life and Times asked, so provided several options about what people's hopes and aspirations and what the priorities should be for the new assembly, from uh, constitutional questions to questions of discrimination. But what we can see first and foremost here is that the highest priority both first and second priority was to improve healthcare and the health service in Northern Ireland. And that's 69% of people had improving healthcare as either their first or second priority for the Assembly. And a close second was the economy and increasing employment opportunities for people in Northern Ireland. And 63% of people had that as their first or second priority. The constitutional issues, way down the list. We've got 18% of people wanted the Assembly to give Northern Ireland a stronger voice in the UK, and 6% wanted the Assembly to make it more likely that Northern Ireland would eventually leave the UK. Just in terms of these constitutional issues, in 1999, the survey asked people their attitudes towards developing relationships with the Scottish and Welsh involved Assemblies. Obviously, Scotland, Welsh, and Northern Irish evolution was happening along the same time. And a majority of people wanted the Assembly to develop relationships with Scotland, 52%. I'm always gantsy when I say 52% nowadays. And 44% wanted improved relations with Wales. And so there was, there was an appetite for increased relations among the devolved legislatures in the early days of devolution. Returning now to local politics, we can see that both improving the NHS and the health service and increasing employment opportunities were priorities across the board. It didn't break down by religion or by gender. It was important for everybody. 
And so we can see in terms of, I'm not sure if you can see the numbers, but in terms of improving the health service in Northern Ireland, between 32% and 44%, it was a high priority for everybody, regardless of, say, age or religion, or gender, sorry, not age. And again, for increased employment opportunities. Lowest one here is among women, 34%, highest is 44% in no religion. These were high priorities. I'm not going to trip over the cables, but just looking down the way towards uh, making it more likely that Northern Ireland will eventually leave the UK. 4% of nationalists, uh, sorry, 4% of Catholics, and in terms of giving NI a stronger voice in the UK, it was 12% of Protestants. These were, not to say they're not unimportant, but these are low priorities compared to fixing the health service and improving the economy. And this pattern has continued every time we've asked these questions since. So, in 1998, 1999, 2000 and 2007, improving the health service was the highest single priority. 42% in 1999, 49% in 2000, and 44% in 2007. It has remained a continuous high priority for what the Assembly should be focusing on. Again, for the economy broadly defined, so if we take together improving the economy specifically and increasing job opportunities, it's a high priority across these, but particularly once we get to 2013 and 2014, when 60 plus percent of people thought that this should be what the Assembly is focusing on. Contextually, this should probably be taken in terms of the global financial crisis, so following 2008 2009, people, and particularly Northern Ireland, are still feeling the effects of this, and so it's understandable that the economy is a particularly high priority. This year, the Young Life in Time Survey, thank you, has asked questions on what would make or what, is, what do young people want from Northern Ireland? What would make it a good place to live? First high priority is the cost of living. 64% of young people think that this is very important for making Northern Ireland a good place that it needs to be controlled. Second highest priority is support for mental health and well-being. 56% of young people think that this is very important. And a third of the highest is the stable political systems. People, young people, are fed up of political institutions collapsing. They want to live somewhere where their political situation is stable. Look towards the constitutional question. Down now on the right, far left hand side, only 23% of young people think that this is very important. Young people are more concerned with living in a Northern Ireland that works. They are less concerned around banging on about constitutional questions. They simply want to be able to go on with their lives and live with some sense of continuity and stability. Even when we break this down by community identity, so leaders, neither unionists or nationalists, nationalists and unionists, this is what is um, very important for making Northern Ireland a good place to live. And while there are some discrepancies and variances, the constitutional status is of higher importance for Protestants than it is for nationalists and leaders. Given the narratives coming since Brexit towards United Ireland and Germany and nationalism's favour, this is probably to be expected. For nationalists, the vibrant culture is particularly important. And we can also see from rights protections are more important for nationalists than for unionists. And this has historically been the case given Northern Ireland pre-1998. But what we take away again is that across the board, regardless of whether you're either unionist or nationalist, Priorities focus on cost of living, mental health, and the stable political system. So it doesn't matter what your community background is, you are more likely to just want a sense of stability and a stable economy so that you can go back and live your life. So just to yeah, just to summarise this situation, since 1998, continuously, people have wanted the Assembly to focus on improving healthcare and improving the economy. And we have politicians going day after day of all strikes and none saying that they want to make Northern Ireland work for all people. That's what we need to focus on. That's, people do not want to be discussing flags and praise predominantly. They're not preoccupied with these things. They simply want to live in a place that works. So now we'll move on to identities. And this, by the way, is in the exhibit you can see down in the play. particularly. So identities on a British Irish spectrum they do always fluctuate a little bit. So this is taken from 2022, I perhaps 2020, so it's when we've been working with the new mode of data collection. Between 2020 and 2022, there is a net increase in people holding a predominantly Irish identity. Uh, 
and that is now 38% hold a predominantly Irish identity, say a net increase of six, compared to 36% who hold a predominantly British identity, which is a net decrease of four. But again, these are very, they're within the margin of error, they're very consistently stable around being fairly equal. Then we look to the Unionist Nationalists and Neither Identities. And on the left here is the Young Ireland Life and Times. And so we can see here that Nationalist is the predominant identity, only slightly ahead of Unionism, and again slightly ahead of those holding Neither Identity. When we look towards the Northern Ireland Life and Times for the adults, um, the Neithers are the predominant nationalist, uh, the predominant identity at 38%, 31% hold a Unionist identity, and 26% hold a Nationalist identity. This has been a consistent trend. If we look from 2006, the Neelers have been the largest community in Northern Ireland consistently. It peaked at 50% in 2019, but generally holds steady around 40-43%. Nationalist identities too tend to hold stable since 1998. It's gone up and down a little, but tends to hold fairly consistent around 25%. What's probably noteworthy is the downward trend in unionist identity. While you can see in 2016 there is a small blip down from 32% to 26 that has recovered. But what we can see from 2008 is a general downward trend where the unionist identity has not reached above 37% again since 2008. Now looking towards the Good Friday Agreement, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this one because it is the 25th anniversary. And so we've asked questions around level of support for the Good Friday Agreement since 2019, and the responses have been generally quite stable, and that there is predominantly a support, a good level of support for the Good Friday Agreement. In 2022, 7 in 10 people believe that the agreement is the best way to govern Northern Ireland, but 55% of respondents believe that it needs work to work effectively, it needs some sort of reform in order to effectively deliver for the people of Northern Ireland, which asks the question around what sort of form is required, what would people support changing about the Good Friday Agreement to make it work? And we asked this question in 2021. And we can see first off that there is a broad consensus that the Bill of Rights should be implemented. This formed part of the original Good Friday Agreement when it was negotiated but has never actually been implemented. 62% of people would like to see this developed and implemented compared to 4% of people who do not want to. When we look towards an end of investigations into troubled related to serious violence, responses are a little more mixed. 46% of responses are against ending investigations and 29% of responses are in favour of it. When we look again into the executive, whether it must include the largest nationalist and unionist parties, people are also mixed. 37% of responses are in favour and 28% of responses are opposed. On this question particularly, it's worth bearing in mind when the fieldwork was done. The Assembly was slipping and running when we did the fieldwork for this round of the survey. And given the current political situation, it's fair to say that attitudes will likely have polarised somewhat on this question. And relatedly, there is majority agreement in that there should be a weighted majority for um, passing votes in the Assembly, such as 60% of all MLAs regardless of their political party. And 58% of people agree that this should be the way forward in order to progress legislation. And there is also a very strong consensus that there should be a civic forum. People want to have stronger input into the political, the political institutions in Northern Ireland. And so, generally speaking, there remains a broad consensus on the Good Friday Agreement. Most people think that it is the best way to govern Northern Ireland. But the way forward is a little more complex. People think it needs reform, but exactly how it should be reformed is something that is up for debate. Obviously, a Bill of Rights, people are supportive of, weighted majority votes for key votes, and the same reform people are very supportive of. There's also support for um, Northern Ireland's Heights own trade and immigration policies, however, the feasibility of that, given the devolved structures, is something a bit more contentious. But if we break this down by age, we can see that there is, generally speaking, increasing, explicit at least, support for the Good Friday Agreement. On some levels this makes sense, because the older you are, the more likely you are going to have experienced the troubles and to understand what's at stake here. But when we look to the differences, they're not explained by higher groups of people being against the agreement. They're explained by higher proportions of people 
saying that they don't know. The reasons for this aren't necessarily clear. Generally, it's a function of survey research where younger people tend to hedge their bets a little more and are less likely to commit to substantive responses. So that could partly explain the increasing level of donors, particularly among younger respondents. What is interesting here, I think, is that the highest proportion of people who say that the agreement is no longer fit for purpose and needs to be substantially changed are among 18 to 24 year olds, and 16% of 18 to 24 year olds feel that the agreement is not suitable anymore and needs substantial reform. And I'd say there are probably two key reasons for this. The first is that these people did not live through the troubles, they don't have the direct experience of what is at stake. I think perhaps more directly, these people have lived through, their political lives have been defined by frequent and long-term collapse of political institutions. And as we saw in the earlier slides, they simply want a politics that works and keeps the country running. And with that in mind, I'm going to pass on to Katie, who will speak about attitudes. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> I'm just going to stay still. Um, can I just check, can you see the screen OK? Would you let me, you can? Yeah, yeah great. OK, so now we're going to talk about attitudes, and as I said, particularly on community relations. Um, so the, this question we've asked since 1998, are relations between Catholics and Protestants better now than five years ago? So the grey line here is people are saying it's about the same, those relations about the same as they were five years ago. The yellow is those saying it's better than five years ago, and then the red saying it's worse. So 50% at the time of the agreement saying relations are better than they were five years ago, which is probably just as well, right? But look how quickly things change. So very um, significantly, in a very short space of time, going down to 28% that saying that they're better um, by 2001, and a rise in those saying that they are worse than they were five years beforehand. So over the first five years post-agreement, you saw this sense that actually relations between Catholics and Protestants are getting worse. Um, and at least at, at the sort of um, a, a quarter of people thinking that. Um, what shifts then uh, towards people being more optimistic is coming at around the time of, um, uh, uh, obviously by this time we had to be in position of um, suspension of the assembly, be in position of um, direct rule effectively. Um, the Shared Future document was uh, uh, published in 2005 uh, under the Labour government and there was a sense primarily that things were getting better um, and better than they had been. Um, and then we see things begin again to get up and down rather and then a significant change happens in um, 2016. After that point we see uh, a decline in those saying that, be, that relations between Catholics and Protestants uh, were better than they were five years ago. What about the confidence in the future? Will relations between Protestants and Catholics be better? So even uh, if you're not confident they are now, do you think they might get better? So definitely 62% of people in 1998 thinking the agreement means that relations between Catholics and Protestants will get better. In five years we expect them to be better. Uh, but look how significantly that drops over a very short period of time, and, and um, those of us who were around at the time do remember there was a, there was a sense of um, concern and anxiety, I think, about what, what this actually meant in practice. Um, things did recover, so a, a sense of think, the possibility of things getting better from the early 2000s, of hopefulness for the future. Um, this peaked um, around the time where we had Sinn Féin and the DUP then, uh, following the St Andrew's Agreement, agreeing to share power together, um, get the Assembly back up and running again, uh, 2007 and um, 8, you see the significant change then. Um, people beginning to think this, things are about the same, but then again, a significant change happening in 2016. Not only do we have a decline in those saying that they think things are going to be better in five years' time, but we also see a rise in those saying things are going to be worse. Um, and that's, uh, and, and then from that point we sort of see uh, a, a fairly clear pattern of decline in confidence for the future. Now, what we've done here is put these things together to see how, how much these, these go together. So the red lines are the 
the, those saying things are worse. The unbroken red line is people saying things are worse than they were five years ago. And then the dotted red line is those saying things will be worse. The unbroken yellow line, things are better. The, the dotted yellow line, things will be better. And what's interesting is those things very much go together. So if people have a sense that things are worse or are better, they have a, that sort of tallies with their sense that things are going to be better or they're going to be worse. So that's quite an interesting pattern over time. Um, and I've also tried to identify there where we had the suspension of the assembly. It seems to have made a big difference post-2017 when we didn't have the assembly functioning. But actually it wasn't too bad when we didn't have the assembly um, for the early 2000s. Um, different context, different government. Um, and we had obviously a very significant shift in the electoral landscape then to, um, by this time, Sinn Féin and the DUP, very much uh, the, the largest parties. Um, St Andrew's Agreement clearly made a difference. Um, there we had the lowest levels of people thinking that things are going to be worse and more, comp were worse, more confidence in the future then. Um, Stormont House Agreement, um, one of a number of agreements that we had in the uh, 2010s, um, but uh, again, that significant moment of the Brexit uh, referendum in 2016. So now I'm going to show you a slide which I cannot explain and if any of you can I'd be delighted to, to hear. So this is, a, this is a question that we have asked since, 20, since 2000. So uh, and more or less the wording has changed slightly but the gist of it is about the same. Has there been any time in the last year when you personally have felt intimidated by Republican murals, curb paintings or flags or loyalist murals, cup paintings, or flags. Um, and you can see there, 17% um, in 2000 saying they had been intimidated by Republican murals, etc. 21% intimidated by loyalists. Um, that that didn't change significantly. And in the those 2000s, when I said that period of confidence about good relations began to get a bit better, you see that reflected there for a little time anyway, in um, these people reporting about whether they felt intimidated or not by flags, etc. Um, 2012, 2013, of course, was the year of the flags protest. It didn't last a year, but the time of the flags protests, uh, 2013. So perhaps that helps explain why people are saying they're more intimidated by loyalist flags. We don't know. Anyway, the shift happens in 2020. So we changed the mode of interviewing then, necessarily, as we had to. We couldn't see anybody face to face. Um, and uh, uh, what else happened about that time? Well, um, by this point, we've had the new decade, new approach agreement. Um, so the assembly was up and running again. Um, there, was, there was a sense of things being about the same in, in relations between Catholics and Protestants, according to the other data. Um, but a dramatic rise in those saying that they felt intimidated by uh, um, paramilitary-related murals, etc. Um, I asked Dominic Bryan about this, seeing if he had any insight, given his work on flags, um, commission, etc. Um, and he's as bewildered as me. So it's, it's an interesting question. So as I say, in the questions in there, we can discuss what, what you might have, if you've got the insight as to what, what made the difference there. Bearing in mind people's experience of uh, their wider environment would have been affected at that time by COVID, of course, so people confined to the, the area around them, perhaps noticing things they hadn't noticed before, who knows. Um, and a totally different question now. Um, a lot of political attitudes, um, we realise, relate to trust in institutions. This is a good measure of the quality of democracy and people's democratic experience and confidence in the democratic environment. And, um, process of democracy in society. And we decided to ask this year questions on trust and trust in governing institutions. Um, these are the results overall we've published in the research update published earlier this year. So the blue are levels of trust uh, in those overall and then the red is levels of distrust. Um, so 2% completely trust the UK government, 3% completely trust the Irish government, 1% completely trust the Northern Ireland Executive, 6% the civil servants, service and in Northern Ireland, and 5% the EU. Um, overall, we see 
possibly re- reassuringly, given the situation, uh, uh, the, the Northern Ireland Civil Service is trusted the most of all these um, institutions responsible for governing Northern Ireland. However, it is not an overwhelming endorsement of them. Um, and the levels of distrust are, are very uh, notable. Um, also, of course, the sense of um, not being particularly bothered either way, about a third of people, a quarter to a third of people saying they neither trust nor distrust these institutions, except for when it comes to the British government, people do have an opinion as to whether they trust them or not. This is trying to break that down um, to see where the differences lie amongst communities in Northern Ireland. So here we see the total levels of trust in these institutions. So total trust in the UK, that's, you know, trust completely or trust slightly, 21%, 28% the Irish government, 37% the European Union, 17% the Northern Ireland Executive, and then 41% the Northern Ireland Civil Service. So perhaps surprisingly, the Northern Ireland Executive has the lowest levels of trust. Now, again, we're taking this in 2022, the the Assembly hasn't been functioning for, um, not properly anyway, for for, um, uh, a significant period of time at the at the time we took this survey. There are interesting differences between communities in response to these questions, possibly unsurprisingly. Um, in terms of trust of unionists, they trust the civil service the most. The 38% of unionists trust the British government. Um, unsurprisingly, perhaps low levels of trust in the Irish government and the uh, in the European Union. Nationalist levels of trust, highest by far in the European Union, um, significantly higher than even trust in the Irish government. Um, trust levels in the Northern Ireland Civil Service, again, possibly higher than we might expect, um, 4% trusting the UK government. And then in terms of those who are neither unionist nor nationalist, um, highest levels of trust, not just in civil service, but also in the European Union. And this is reflected in our wider um, data about the neithers and how they are most likely to be pro-Remain and have um, uh, sentiments reflected in uh, that pro-Remain um, um, attitude. Also distrust, and I think distrust is almost more interesting than trust, um, because this is a, like an active um, decision <laughs> uh, to not trust, and of course that, that, makes, that helps um, shape your, um, uh, the way you engage in, in, uh, as uh, citizens, of course. So total levels of distrust, 60% Distrust the UK government, very high. Uh, 52% actively distrust the Northern Ireland executive, and then 36% distrust the Irish government, 30% distrust the EU, and only 20% distrust the civil service. Um, Again, possibly a good thing, given how much responsibility they have at the moment. In terms of unionist levels of distrust, no massive differences um, between them. Um, I think the striking thing is just how high those levels of distrust are amongst uh, unionists. Um, nationalists, very significant, actively distrusting the British government for some reason. Um, and then the Northern Ireland executive, um, high levels of distrust in that as well. Um, I wonder if it would be different at different times, if we had asked at different times, who knows. And then the neithers. Again, a similar, very similarly to the nationalists in terms of general pattern, highest levels of distrust in the British government and in the Northern Ireland executive. And again, I think it's difficult to interpret this correctly unless we bear in mind attitudes towards Brexit and what's happened since. Um, last but not least, um, expectations. So one question we have asked consistently since 1998 is what is your preferred long-term policy for Northern Ireland? Um, And we see a very clear pattern over time. So this orange line, broken line, is about direct rule, whether you'd like to see direct rule in Northern Ireland. And it really doesn't go up. The the question is um, asked separately from 2007 onwards. The support for direct rule is relatively stable. Um, the highest was in 2018 at 21%. Pretty much it's around 14 or so percent. It, um, it's been 12 for the last couple of years. Um, what's, where we see a big change is support for devolution within the UK as being people's long-term pre- uh, preferred policy for Northern Ireland. 
So um, highest there in um, 2000 at 60, and then very significant decline since um, 2016 in particular, uh, where we see um, uh, um, at the same time since 2016, we see that rising support for Irish unification as a preferred long-term outcome for Northern Ireland. To such a degree, now that there's only four percentage points different, difference between those who say they want Irish unification as a long-term policy for Northern Ireland compared to those saying they want devolution within the UK as a long-term policy for Northern Ireland. And possibly this was in the mind of the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland <coughs> when he was here back in April saying that you know, devolution within the UK is basically what the what the union is dependent upon. Um, the alternative is is uh, is, is gaining um, in significance, at least according to polling data like this. Um, and this is just to put it in a slightly different way. We can see how significant the shift has been. So essentially, as all of us know, that the, the the overriding theme was one of consistency, effectively. That for, for a long period of time, it was quite clear that devolution within the UK was the preferred outcome for the majority of people. Um, so in 2013, 15% saying Irish unification was their preferred long-term outcome, 54% devolution within the UK. Um, 10 years later, um, as I say, 31% for Irish unification, 35% for devolution. So a very significant change. What might have made the difference? So Brexit, um, we come to it at last. Does Brexit make the United Ireland more likely or more desirable? Um, sorry, that, that I'm not sure if the, the, the colours are great for this, but essentially we've asked this question um, since 2016. Um, and so we have really interesting data, not least of course because we're reflecting on what's happened since the referendum, all the... Um, trials and tribulations of the negotiations, the impact of the protocol as well. So, um, in terms of whether Brexit makes United Ireland more likely, we now see 63% saying that it does, um, 21% say it makes no difference. Under those saying uh, whether it makes United Ireland more desirable, still the plurality of people say it makes no difference to their views on, on Irish unification and whether it's desirable or not but we see 38% now saying that it makes them more in favour. So to break that down by um, political community. Um, so for the unionists here, so originally 62% in 2016 saying Brexit makes no difference to the views on whether a United Ireland is, is, whether it makes a United Ireland more likely, it makes no difference to it. Um, and then from 2020 onwards, so the protocol was uh, agreed in the end of in, in October 2019. People, um, partly because it wasn't well explained, partly because of the um, contradictory messages from the from the government and, and others about what the protocol meant, it wasn't really until 2020 that we saw the the um, the awareness of the protocol becoming um, more widespread. So 2020, a significant change, and at that point, we saw the plurality of unionists saying Brexit makes United Ireland more likely. So that pattern has remained over the past three years. So now 45% of unionists say it makes United Ireland more likely compared to 36% say so it makes no difference. Amongst those who are neither unionists nor nationalists again at the beginning, 51% makes no difference. Um, very significant change from 2020 onwards, leap up, 64% saying it makes United Ireland more likely. And then amongst nationalists, originally, the plurality of nationalists said Brexit doesn't make it more likely or not. But very quickly, the shift came um, to now 87% of nationalists saying Brexit makes a United Ireland more likely. And then in terms of desirability, um, amongst unionists, 80% back in 2016 makes no difference. We still see a clear majority of unionists saying it doesn't make them think any differently about uh, a united Ireland and, and how favourable they would be towards it, um, with the exception of 6% now. Um, and we did see a, a rise there post-protocol of those saying that they are um, 
less in favour of United Ireland than they were even before Brexit. Um, amongst the neighbours, very significant change there happening in 2020. So again, originally makes no difference. Um, 45% in 2020 saying makes no difference to 42% saying makes it uh, makes them more in favour of Irish unity. And now we see 42% um, saying it makes them more in favour of the United Ireland. 42% saying it makes no difference. So that's a really significant shift and touches on what I was mentioning before. And then nationalists, unsurprisingly, perhaps um, increasingly of the view that Brexit makes them more in favour of the United Ireland. Notably, that shift didn't happen with the protocol. That, that was in the process of the negotiations that we saw that, uh, that, that rise in um, um, uh, the sense of desirability of Irish unification amongst nationalists. So my last slide um, is on this question. Uh, in 20 years' time, would the United Kingdom or a united Ireland exist? So we've traditionally consistently asked a question about Irish unification. Will a united Ireland exist in 20 years' time? And putting it very simply, the view was um, predominantly it was quite unlikely. Um, we started asking a question on whether the United Kingdom would exist um, in 2020. And uh, at that time, we saw 2020, 31% um, saying um, the United Kingdom was quite likely to exist in uh, 20 years' time. That was significantly more than saying a United Ireland would exist in 20 years' time. In 2021, the data was more or less even in terms of expectations about uh, United Kingdom existing or Irish uh, United Ireland existing. And then in this 2022 results we see 38% um, uh, saying United Kingdom will exist in 20 years time, is likely to exist in 20 years time, compared to 45% saying United Ireland um, is likely to exist in 20 years time. So very significant change um, and reflecting all sorts of the dynamics that we've been touching on um, in this presentation. So to conclude, just to remind you have all that we've thrown at you for <laughs> the last little while. So in terms of priorities, tout ça change, basically. Uh, has anybody been discussing the health service recently in Northern Ireland? Absolutely. So 25 years ago, that was a priority, along with the economy, concerns about cost of living. That remains the same today. Asking young people in particular, we didn't ask them about wider health service. We asked them specifically about mental health and well-being and the... the um, overwhelming sense that this is very important to our young people is one that I think is really striking, particularly in the context of cuts to services that, um, that uh, relate to mental health support, um, support particularly for young people. It's very striking. Um, identities, nothing too radical on the British Irish, interestingly. A uh, good amount of consistency, although rising sense of rising, rising the number of those saying they are exclusively Irish um, and, and not a bit British. Um, in terms of the nationalist, unionist, neither's. One thing we did see in the Young Life and Times amongst the sixteen-year-olds is those saying they don't know, and. Uh, it picks up on something Ben was saying about um, the way that young people tend to answer these surveys, perhaps, but also maybe it tells us something more generally about this, not just the lack of interest in the constitutional future or status, but also those identities don't really mean very much to them. Uh, so they don't know what does neither mean anyway. Um, so what happens, looking ahead for Northern Ireland society, what happens to those don't knows? as well as to the neithers, so we tend to focus a lot on the neithers. What about those young people who clearly are engaged in society, they still have very clear opinions about the need for, um, uh, um, you know, for a low cost of living, healthy economy, jobs, etc. Uh, what, what will happen to them in terms of their political engagement? Then in attitudes, notable decline in optimism. We haven't really reached those levels of optimism that we saw in terms of community relations at the beginning, 25 years ago. Do you note the huge impact of Brexit? Um, again, if you can explain to me what happened in 2020 about the flags, uh, that would be great. And then striking is the low levels of trust in democratic institutions, governing institutions, 
high levels of distrust um, across the board, really. And then looking ahead to the future, um, the impact of Brexit, which of course directly affects um, the legal, political, economic um, and identity landscapes of Northern Ireland and these islands. Um, unsurprisingly, it's affected people's political um, views and expectations um, and wishes as well. Um, so to conclude, the future is genuinely unknown um, and uh, there are things to be concerned about here, particularly in relation to distrust, I think, um, particularly in relation to this idea that people's priorities then have not yet been fully, um, fully met by any means. Um, and indeed the, the assembly which is designed to meet those needs is, is currently not functioning. Um, but anyway, we welcome your questions and any explanations that you may have for this data and uh, just want to conclude by paying tribute to all the ARC team for your excellent work. Thanks Paula for letting us take part. Thanks Dirk for Young Life and Times, um, the Kids Life and Times survey as well. It's really fantastic data and it's a pleasure being working with you over the last few years. Thank you. Thank you.